The Greater Blue-Legged Bulbul by Miranda Collinge Read by Claire Foy She'd been listening to the drip for days. Though the rain seemed to be easing, it was as steady as ever. Thunk. Thunk. Somehow the water was getting through. However many floors down they were, somewhere in the hold, which was, she noted almost in admiration, the darkest place she'd ever been. The walls were coated in something black and pungent. Even the cylinder of light slanting through the open porthole didn't seem to be penetrating the blackness so much as getting sucked in by it. She could see only dimly the crisscross of dried reeds that surrounded her on every side. Dank was the word. Dank, dank, dank. So, he said. So, she said quickly. For a moment she'd forgotten he was there. You going to talk to me today? She exhaled. Sure. Because your attitude so far has been, you know, a little sucky. I know, she said. I'm sorry, it's not fair on you. No, it's not. We're in the same boat, after all. I know. His voice brightened. What day do you think it is, anyway? I'm thinking 25, 30. It's 37, she said. Wow, 37, no way. I would not have guessed. I would say time flies, but, <laughs> you know. Uh-huh, she said. And seeing as we're here, and it's just us, we might as well keep each other company. Mm-hmm. She heard a rustle and saw him out of the corner of her eye, through the reed bars that separated them, step into the sloping column of light. He stood quietly, craning his head every which way to take in his surroundings, seemingly lost in thought, though she knew that he couldn't be. He didn't seem to notice her. He was, she had to admit, breathtakingly beautiful. The dark crest above his brow, the pale pink at his throat, the outrageous shock of blue at his feet. All at once he was looking right at her. Were you checking me out? he asked. No, she said, crisply, and turned back to her pile of seeds. Ha ha, you were too, you were totally checking me out. He gave a small delighted hop. She went back to pecking, keeping her eyes trained firmly towards the floor of her cage. She could feel him looking, blinking dumbly, and she sensed the sudden sideways movement as he cocked his head. He looked away, up to the ceiling, as though noticing the drip for the first time and trying to locate its source. He looked at her again. Where was it you said you were from, anyway? Oh, you know, around. She looked up to gauge his interest. He returned her gaze blankly. Kind of near the almond groves, towards the river, near the bend with the big rock in the middle. She replied, not lifting her head. OK, I had an aunt over that way, though she and my mother didn't get along so well. I'm from the hillside, as you know. I think you can see it from down there. Mother nested up higher because it was leafier, less crowded and a bit more, I don't know, civilised, maybe. No one in each other's faces all day. Did you tell me that before, that you're from the groves? I think so, yes. He was already looking wistfully towards the porthole as he spoke. So, you have any idea why they chose you? Chose. It didn't seem quite the right word. There had been three of them huddled together, looking for grubs under the shade of a tamarisk, cooing and bustling and busy in their work. She'd felt the hands before she'd seen them, the fingers fastening around her ribcage, the palms flattening her wings, the woman's thumb on the sides of her throat, keeping her head from turning. She had felt herself being lifted up, the other two scrabbling away in different directions, their wings batting the tamarisk pink flowers as they made their escape. When the lid of the wicker basket closed over her head, she remembered how the world had gone dark. Just lucky, I guess, she said. Huh, he said. You know, and I realise this may sound arrogant, but I kind of knew it would be me. I just... He gazed towards the light, his yellow eyes drifting out of focus. Knew... How come? Well, <laughs> he laughed sheepishly. 
there aren't a lot of us around, as you know. So when it started happening to all the others, the pipettes and the sandpipers, the red shanks and the thick knees, I mean, come on, the thick knees, it just seemed like they'd come for us too. I made a point of keeping on top of my groom and making sure my plumage was on point. He looked at her expectantly. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed the sheen on my wing bar, but I've been buffing my covers pretty meticulously, even in here. They're nice, she said. Very shiny. His chest flushed. Oh, thanks. I just knew that they'd want to make sure they got a good one. Right, she said. I don't know, with me it just felt a bit more arbitrary. I can imagine, he laughed. No, no, I'm just kidding. I'm sure they took you for a good reason. I know we all get the glitz, but... He looked sympathetically at her breast. There's something homely about all those torps and browns. I bet you blend right in. Except when it matters, she laughed abruptly. But he didn't. She realised he was waiting. So how did they get you? She obliged. Ha, well, I was obviously keen to be the one. We all were, but I didn't want to make it easy for them. Men like the thrill of the chase, as you know. You want this, he fanned his tail, gave a coy dip of his head. You're going to have to earn it, am I right? She laughed flatly. I was out on my own for the morning. It was one of those super nice days when the crocuses are peeking out from the lower hills, but there are still snow blotches on the peaks. I was flying over the valley and I saw a couple of younger guys, the sons I guess, walking under the date palms with a whole bunch of baskets and cages on this kind of wooden cart thing. It wasn't hard to twig what they were doing. And I thought to myself, okay, let's do this. And I pulled off one of my, <laughs> if I say so myself, next level flying displays. It was one of the really complex ones with all the loop-de-loops and swoops and I was doing as much trilling as I could and making sure that the sun caught my leading edge just so. It must have been kind of spectacular to see. I know it felt good. And then, just to mess with them a little, I landed right on top of the tallest palm I could see. It must have been 30 foot high. It was honestly hilarious. They were so mad. But they got you down somehow. She was annoyed that she wanted to know. Well, I sat down on top of the tree for a long, long time. I could see them looking up at me and pointing, so I knew they were interested. Then I see the smallest one, Ham, maybe, start shinning his way up the trunk towards me. Like I said, it was a tall tree, and even though it was early morning, the air was already heating up and I could hear his grunts and see the sweat on his forehead as he got near the top. Then, and this is the best part, when he was almost up to the crown and I could see him holding on to the net, using all the strength in his other arm not to fall off, I glided gracefully as can be all the way down to the ground and landed right in front of one with the scraggly beard. Shem. Yeah, right, Shem. And I let him scoop me right up. <laughs> if he hadn't put me in the basket quick, I think Ham would have straight up wrung my neck. Wow, she said. They must have really wanted you. Yeah. He looked shyly at the floor. I guess they did. Do you know what happened to any of the others? She asked. The others? You know, the ones they didn't pick. Well, I guess we kind of know, don't we? Yes, I suppose we do. She looked out towards the porthole. Was it still raining? In the flat light, it was hard to tell. The sea, dark, grey and angry, stretched out to the horizon. She tried not to think about her mother, her sisters, her brothers who would have flown as far and for as long as they could before exhaustion won over and they dropped like rocks. She hoped that none of them had been the ones they'd heard about who'd tried to land on the deck, while the sons and their wives had flapped furiously at them with their sleeves and everything was a flurry of squawks and feathers and globs of bird shit. Eventually rumours spread that the old man had let the tigers loose to pace up and down and the birds had stopped coming. Anyway... He spun around once, twice. This place isn't really so bad, right? Plenty of fresh air, some good seed, a nice pile of soft leaves. She did not follow his gaze. How's your nest building, by the way? He asked. Well, to be honest, I've never tried. Oh, he looked disappointed. So that's okay. You're young, but I guess you can learn. And what about bugs and stuff? You know how to find the good ones. I don't want our kids, our future kids, I mean, getting skinny now. I get by. Well, you can learn that too, I suppose. 
It just so happens I come from a long line of expert bug hunters. My mother said dad was honestly one of the very best. And I'm sure I can give you a few pointers when it's time to get started. Thank you, she said. That's kind. Speaking of getting started, he said, cocking his head towards the pile of leaves. And no pressure from me, of course, but <laughs> what do you think folks do for fun round here? Well, I don't know, she said, but I think there are bars here for a reason. She gestured towards the panel of reeds between them. They don't want the place to be overrun, and anyway, this is no place for an egg. Ha, <laughs> right, of course. Well, maybe we'll just keep talking then. Talking's good. I could talk all day. How far did we get last time? Let's see. Uh, you listed what you like to eat, ran through some favourite songs. You mentioned you've got sisters and a brother. Ha! Huh? I don't know if we should be using the present tense anymore. Oh, yes, sure, sorry. Had, I mean. I don't sweat it. We're all adjusting, right? To be honest, we didn't stick together too long after we hatched anyway. We all had places to be. My brother headed east because he'd heard there was some A-grade figs out that way and my sisters got hitched pretty quick. So it was just me and Ma, really. Which was kind of how we liked it anyway, we're so close. But I know she'd be proud of me now. It was a dream. For me, I mean. I had brothers and sisters too, she said. No way, he said. That's so cool. I mean, we've got so much in common. Yes, she said, feeling anxious now. She scrabbled around for another question. What do you like doing for fun when you're not bug hunting? Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Okay, uh, yeah, I guess I like hanging with my buddies, practising my aerobatics displays. Like I say, you never know when they're going to come in useful. And, you know, just generally taking care of myself, preening, being the best version of me I can be. She waited for the return question, but it didn't come. What did she like, anyway? Soaring over the marshes, feeling the warm air cushioning her breast feathers and wings, pressing her up. Watching the day break over the mountains, seeing the violent pinks creep up the sky, curling up in the nest, nestling her beak under her wing and her whole body into her mother's. Yes, she thought. A selfish breed. To be honest, he continued, I think they're pretty lucky to have me. Us, I mean, you don't get a lot of specimens that look this good, that fly so well, that can spot a cricket from 50 feet up. I mean, they didn't cause the graters for nothing. I think it's more of a size thing, she said. What is? Greater. It's because we're bigger. The lesses are just a bit smaller than us, that's all. Well, it's an interesting theory, but I respectfully disagree. Ma told me it was because our brains are bigger and our feathers are brighter and, you know, the whole package is just more... But still, his eyes became serious. We have a duty to care for the others too, the weaker ones. It's not their fault. It's our job to be leaders, to step up. You mean the lessers? I'm not sure the lessers are even on here, to be honest. I mean, they had a lot to gather and no disrespect, but they're farmers, not zoologists. It's kind of impossible they wouldn't have missed a few. He seemed not to have heard. And when this whole thing is over with, when they let us out of here, assuming that's his wish, of course, we've got a serious job to do. Repopulating a whole species is going to take time and effort and commitment. We've got to be ready. But it's going to be worth it. Can you imagine? A nest packed tight with little blue speck legs. A whole new fresh world populated by us. Full of little me's. <laughs> I mean, it's going to be something else. She said nothing. But with a swift twitch of her head, turned towards the reed panel nearest the porthole. She snapped a frond in her beak and began twisting. Hey, what are you even doing? He shouted. You know they won't like that. She could feel the reeds straining, the fibres loosening. It was easier than she'd expected. She realised almost with a smile that she could have done it days ago. Weeks. Look, that's not even funny. If they catch you doing that, they'll stop our seed supply for a week and I need my food or I get super cranky. There was a tiny snap, snap, snap as each fibre gave way to the next. With a final twist, the reed broke in two. She pushed her head between the frayed ends, wiggling her folded wings into the gap, feeling her breastbone squeezed tight. Then she was out the other side, 
flapping madly in the close air. She reached the open porthole and landed on its rim, breathing hard. Below her, the waves heaved and fell. He, he said again, quieter this time, his crest raised like a question mark, his breast feathers plushing from pink to red. If you even think about it, even think about it, I swear to you, it's the end of us. The end. She looked at him, his yellow eyes blazing, his chest puffed. Sensational. She hoped she'd always think of him that way. I'll take my chances, she called to him over her wing, as she took off towards the furious sea. Hello, I'm Andrew O'Hagan. Thank you so much for listening to Esquire's Summer Fiction series in aid of UNICEF UK's Save Generation COVID Appeal, which is supporting children and families impacted by coronavirus across the world. Please donate at www.unicef.org.uk slash generation COVID. Thank you.